Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Sunday for Sunday, February 11th, 2024. We've got another great show for you this week. We'll be joined in the first segment by the Legal Eagles, David Levine, Kevin Walsh, both of Groom Law Group, here to break down what's happening on Capitol Hill. And then we'll turn our attention in, in the second segment to Oliver Rennick of the Schwab Network to help break down the events in the market. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. Welcome back. Now time to take a spin around Capitol Hill. There's a lot going on these days and joining us now to help break down litigation, regulation, legislation, and a lot more. David Levine, Kevin Walsh, both are principals with Groom Law Group. That's an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. And we fondly refer to them as the Legal Eagles. Eagles, great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thanks for having us on. You know, it's Super Bowl uh, weekend. And, uh, you know, I think you left off one of the uh, one of the, the rhyming words this week, which is, you know, inspiration. Uh, okay. You know, hopefully it's an inspirational game. And I know that, you know, with Arisa turning 50, this is a year where people are are really trying to do some ideation to figure out what it should look like going forward. Yeah, I wonder why, it, it, David, I want to come to you because I want to talk. But before we do, I just want to set it up. I wonder why for today's game, instead of the NFL logo, we didn't put like Arisa 20, 20, or 1964 to twenty. Or 1974 to 2024. But David, you can answer that, but also go ahead. I I have an answer. I just want to go straight to that because that's what people are more interested in today. Okay. The the short answer is, you know, the NFL is a very valuable franchise, but retirement is worth 20, 30 trillion dollars, far more expensive. So the licensing rights for the ERISA name, it just might not be practical for the game. It, you're absolutely right. All right, David, in all seriousness, I, I was kind of serious too, because I would love to see um, that on top of stadia, on the field, et cetera. But, but David, let's talk about Massachusetts. There's some legislation that he and his team propose. So thoughts on that? Absolutely. It, like Representative Neal, has at various times over the past, almost feels like a decade now, introduced legislation that's designed to increase savings, kind of national encouragement of IRA, of people who don't necessarily have retirement plans, but to create automatic IRA programs. And this has been around for over a decade in proposed form, where these IRA programs would basically allow companies where they don't have retirement plans to effectively help people set up and fund IRAs on to save for their retirement. And a side effect that this could be, of course, is more employers might be interested in actually de- establishing employer plans. Now, Representative Neal has reintroduced legislation. There are tweaks, there are changes in this legislation. One notable thing that really jumped out at me is there's actually a provision in this legislation that talks about creating IRAs for non-employees, hmm. which can co- go to things like the gig economy and contractors. So there's all very interesting language in this legislation. But in the end, it's another step and in the process of creating sort of a, a broader tapestry of coverage across the world, and in the United States at least. The other piece of it and that's in there that's, I think, important to mention is it, res- is it recognizes that there's a lot has has changed over the recent years. We have we have it's in the double digits now. State programs that are up and are up and running, where people in a state, if you do not, ha- if your employer doesn't have a retirement plan for its employees, you may be required to, as an employer, to contribute through payroll to a state IRA program. Cal Savers is one. Oregon has them. Virginia, all these different states have different things. Well, Oregon is a little different. But the key takeaway on this is you've got these different programs, and it recognizes the role of these programs as well. So it blends a federal overlay on top of the state programs, on top of the fact of the voluntary employer system, which really is a movement to try to increase and enhance coverage. My last comment I'll really make about this, because we can go in the weeds, but that's the basic premise of this, is that it's interesting because the amount of support for these automatic IRAs has really changed over time. When they first came out, 
they were not necessarily viewed by some in the industry as a great positive. They thought that it, that it was the government getting too involved, but now you see more interest. And the question is maybe why? I think it's A, because people realize the need for increased coverage for people who don't have benefit pro programs, especially in smaller employers where you have that gap. Number two, we are in a capitalist society, but I think if you look at it realistically, as people discover that retirement savings can be good for employees, it avoids my favorite word, retire in place, because people can't afford to retire, so no RIP. But also, it, it does, from even a business standpoint, it gets people interested in retirement and savings, which means that we may see the creation of more plans and other things. And to bring up something we haven't talked about as much in the last year, people it gets people looking at whether single employer plans or pooled employer plans and other solutions. So kind of, as I said, to close it out, fills out the tapestry of solutions that's available to provide for people's retirements. Yeah. And, and Kevin, I want to come to you. And we were joking about ERISA uh, but this is the, the year, the 50th anniversary, Rissa. And I, I suspect, and I want to get your validation on this, that we're going to see more bold proposals for what the next 50 years of Arissa. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be around for that, but what the next 50, after 50 years. But, uh, right? I mean, we're going to, this is, these are some bold initiatives. We need that. We need bold thinking. That's right, Jeff. And if, if we look legislatively, you know, realistically, this isn't a year where a lot's going to get done. Um, but if we think about ERISA at 50 and, you know, legislators are thinking about it, industry is thinking about it. And it's a time where, you know, retirement really isn't the focus because, you know, we've shifted from 1974 with the defined benefit plan based framework to one that's defined contribution and now almost to one that's individual retirement account based. Um, I would expect we'll see both proposals, not just in Congress, but, you know, in white papers from academics um, and from industry groups about ways that we can, you know, future proof ERISA so that, you know, folks are saving more, folks are getting better outcomes on their savings. Um, and then it takes into account that folks are living longer. So, you know, the retirement system has worked fairly well um, for the last 50. But I think there's always hope that as we approach 50, we can figure out what's working, what isn't working, and how we can make it better. Yeah, and David, I want to finish with you and and um and 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 close out the segment. You use the word tapestry. There isn't a one size fits all. You mentioned the gig economy. Uh, people work differently than they did fifty years ago, even ten years ago, even twenty years ago. So that tapestry approach. How do you catch all the people? Three hundred thirty million Americans, right? And more to <laughs> more to come. I mean, that's a lot of people that have to be go through the system, and we want them to take advantage and be able to save and do it cost effectively and also be able to be independent uh, as long as they want to be. Absolutely. And I think, Jeff, there I think there's wide agreement that the employer system, I know there are some who think the employer system doesn't work, but I think the vast majority of people think that the employer system has has turned out to be pretty decent compared to a lot of other options. The employer system allows for saving Significant amounts can do well by people. And I think a lot of people will say, this is the one silver bullet or this is the silver bullet. There is no magic solution to any of this. And we don't know which one is going to be dominant. My personal view is we're not going to wind up in a world where there is one plan or one solution that dominates them all. It's really about, and I think it's the American way, giving people choice and flexibility rather than saying it must be A or must be B gets more people in the system, but it reflects the individual autonomy that I think business owners and people like to work under. Yeah, really good way to end the segment. Gentlemen, thanks so much for breaking it down. I think this we're going to be talking about some of these bold solutions in weeks to come. Wishing you the best weekend. Enjoy the game, and uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for having us on, Jeff, and thank you, listeners. Bye, thank gentlemen. Everybody. Have Enjoy a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, 
the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back. Now time to take a spin around. Marcus joining us online is the lead anchor for the Schwab Network, Oliver Rennick. Oliver, thanks so much for stopping by the program this morning. Absolutely, Jeff. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Uh, I want to ask you, I'm going to kick things off by asking you about the R word, recession. Uh, we talked a little bit about this on yesterday's BRN Weekly with Christina Hooper and Jane King. But I want to get Oliver Rennick's assessment of the market because there are a lot of Debbie Downers out there, Oliver, that's saying it is imminent. And I feel like it's an echo chamber because you and I have been talking ever since we launched this podcast five, six years ago. That's all we've heard is recession, recession, recession. Your thoughts? <laughs> It continues to move further away. We have had some of the most impressive data of the last two years within the last two months. Um, we've continued to see the trampoline landing that I described last year, which is a bounce back, a resurgence of growth um, that very few people saw coming, um, and the market continues to reprice around that. We now have PMIs. Um, in expansionary territory. Um, we have ISMs that we saw continue on the services side to reflect a very strong consumer. And even on the very sluggish manufacturing side, which many were arguing was a key indicator of recession the past year, are now nearly expanding as well. And it fits with the general trend of a better than expected economy, a very strong labor market. Obviously, the last employment print we discussed was a huge blowout figure. Jobless claims again this week were solid. It, it, the recession case basically at this point hinges on a fear around commercial real estate contagion and uh, regional bank risk, which I don't find to be a particularly compelling case because – there are so many regional banks around America that it makes sense during a time in which the market is really punishing bad business models that some of these should either consolidate or be bought or maybe just go away um, if they don't make sense in a non-zero interest rate environment. So uh, I, the recession discussion should basically be kind of at the bottom of our list right now. Oliver, I want to I want to pick up on something you said. You talked about the commercial real estate and something that you and I have talked about for many months on this program and and actually for many years. Uh, some disappointing numbers from regional banks, but any sign, uh, you know, companies, IBM, others forcing their employees back to work either on a three day or five day schedule, some kind of variation, maybe a hybrid, but they're forcing people back, saying you got to move back, you got to go in. So. Um, any sense for if the real estate, the commercial real estate market is going to come back? What are we going to do with those office spaces? Do we turn them residential? My sense is that the malls doing okay. People, I was at the mall, the South Park Mall here in Charlotte. People are out on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I don't go every day to shop, but I like to walk around. There were there were people out in full. So what about that commercial uh, office space? Is it going to be leased? And what does that mean for uh, the future? It's a, a tough question to figure out because it's very um, case by case dependent. Uh, number one, uh, number two is that it seems like we all know the risk, 
and I, you know that's why a lot of these businesses are trading at very low prices compared to their highs. It seems like the market generally has um, been preparing for this big fallout uh, from commercial real estate, and so that should, in theory, kind of insulate us a little bit um, from it. But I mean, you look around, there's a lot of empty office buildings, and I have no idea what they're going to put in them. So um, we have a lot of guests on who argue if you choose based on the recency of construction um, of buildings and the amount of sort of amenities in the office space that these offices will uh, find tenants. Um, I don't know. Maybe they turn into giant uh, data warehouses for AI the technology. I don't have a great answer to it, to be honest, but looking at the market action, it looks like so far we've treated it as a fairly insulated risk. Um, and, um, you know, some of it is contingent on interest rates for sure. I do think that there is a lot of confidence um, being injected into the market through the assumption of a massive interest rate reversal, which will lessen the burden, the debt burden of a lot of these businesses. But, um, you know, there's a good case to be made that we're not going to get nearly as many cuts as the market wants. So there certainly could be some tension around that. But at the moment, it just doesn't seem like it has the kind of the explosive power, enough gunpowder behind it to really blow up the market. Oliver, you mentioned artificial intelligence. Uh, I want to ask you about tech stocks. This this uh, week we had the S&P 500 at an all-time high. I think it was like 5,000, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we had 5,000. Lo- yeah. A lot of that driven by these tech companies, Microsoft, I think is the most highly valued uh, company in the world surpassing Apple. Let's talk about tech for a second. Let's talk about AI. I just, by the way, I just read a report. I want to get your reaction to this before you do the whole, the whole tech conversation. I saw that the department of energy is releasing regulations for uh, crypto miners and artificial intelligence on how they're consuming energy. So, uh, I wonder if that will be a you know and and by the way it's estimated that they're consuming the energy of the state of Washington needed for the to power the state of Washington. I, I don't know how they got to that. Think it, think it's pretty interesting. But but back to tech. What tell us about tech? I mean Microsoft doing extremely well. Apple ch- chopping on its heels. Amazon though it had some layoffs in uh, healthcare. Your thoughts? Yeah, they uh, continue to generally impress. The AI theme uh, is much more real than other hype cycles that we've been through in terms of its actual utility, but some of it still probably is a little bit of hype. A lot of valuations have really grown and expanded, so they're going to have to earn their way into those valuations. Um, But companies like NVIDIA are suggesting that they can, uh, where some of these big, big earnings booms have really helped to offset the price action. But NVIDIA is really a standalone in that regard. Uh, in terms of its valuation. So valuations are definitely something to contend with no matter what the kind of secular theme is driving valuations because we are getting pretty lofty again. But we're still below where we're in COVID. They're not bubble level. So we're not at, at like dot-com COVID bubble style valuations. Definitely means the pressure is on for AI products and services to uh, really change markets and bring in new consumers. The one thing I do kind of worry about is that a lot of the chip making stocks and stuff that are moving on this, that are tied to data centers and such. I just wonder how much overlap with existing customers and um, uh, businesses uh, AI is going to have because there might be a little bit of over speculation on how dramatically the customer demands are going to change because there's basically this big gold rush happening where everybody's buying up all the picks and shovels and um, it seems really exciting, but Product-wise, like, there still needs to be a lot more innovation. So everybody says it's coming. ChatGPT has already definitely made some powerful um, inroads into new AI, you know, productivity and stuff. Um, but, yeah, you don't mess with tech. Um, what's important <laughs> is that the market has actually dispersed quite a bit. So, like, think about the Magnificent 7. Tesla is no longer magnificent on the chart. It's broken down. It's been down trending for years now. Uh, even Apple has now gone sideways, so it's kind of shifted to like the five. That's a sign of a, of a healthy market. Even though there's been a lot of concentration in the market, it's concentrating in the places with the most reliable cash flows and profits, and that makes sense. So it's not really something you want to fight when it is concentrated in high quality from a, a fundamental standpoint. 
Oliver, I, and just to pick up on something, I just read, read something that came across the wire this afternoon. Sam Altman seeks – I don't know if you can hear Peaches in the background screaming. She wants to eat. But Sam Altman seeks as much as $7 trillion for new AI chip yeah. project. Apparently, he wants to overhaul the global semiconductor industry. Peaches, I'll be with you in a second. But uh, he needs trillions of dollars to do that. Your reaction – because you were talking about NVIDIA. They create a lot right. of the chipsets. Well, this is kind of the case in point is that – that's a lot of chips. That's a lot of data centers. That's, you know, going to require e- – an even – he's basically saying that AI is going to be greater than the existing product and service suite offered at Microsoft and Apple combined, which, of course, is the culmination of, you know, two decades, three decades of um, innovation and um, – you know, the internet. So, yeah, I think when we start talking about $7 trillion of data center build out, you're starting to get to a level that the market's going to want to see real results uh, and impact sooner than later. You know, if we start building out to that degree, because it wasn't long ago, it was basically like six months ago that there was a bit of a chip glut. Uh, and uh, over inventory, and AI is helping clean all that out. But, um, you know, there is still a lot of proving, I think, that needs to be done. So um, at the time, now, as far as investors are concerned, you generally just, you know, err on the side of high-quality companies that have a lot of cash flow and profits, and you should be okay. But some of these names are definitely getting a little bit uh, probably extended until we really see real applications. Yeah, okay. um, and, you know, it, it, that are greater than like you know the internet itself. So I, I'm not the AI expert. Maybe it will be, but uh, it ultimately is using the internet. So I don't think it can be quite as profound as the creation of the internet. But yeah, his, yeah, his Sam Altman is um, certainly certainly has some lofty visions. Yeah, and he's considered, I guess, considered a rock star. He, he's right there next to Taylor Taylor Swift. Uh, Oliver, we're going to have to leave it here, folks. Don't forget to check out the coverage on the Schwab Network, Oliver. It bookends the coverage each and every day. You get analysis like this every day and every evening, every morning, every evening. Oliver Rennick, great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. See you. Bye-bye. Take care, Oliver. Bye. Later, dude. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more all in one place. That's right, one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content? Then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow with another edition of BRN AM. We'll have a very special guest or guests i should say in this case until then i'm jeff snyder stay safe keep on saving and don't forget roll with the changes